Hello there. My name's Phil Williams and I would like to welcome you to Audio Angling, the podcast site of fishingfilmsandfacts.co.uk. Back in the 1970s, I used to work with a very keen and successful course match angler, Dave Trafford, who once took me down to the River Trent for a match session come lesson, which as I recall was quite successful, and which as a non-course angler I enjoyed very much. Then, as so often happens to people in the twenties, work and family commitments take control of great swathes of your life, and as is the way, people simply drift off in the separate directions, which in part explains why I haven't seen Dave, in whose company I am right now, from those days to this. As I've said, at the time you was a very keen course match angler, but I believe you felt you was becoming stale and progressively less competitive which you put down to a loss of interest and initially took what was supposedly a short break, which as family and other commitments kicked in, ultimately turned out to be the best part of 25 years, with quite a recent return to competitive fishing where your speciality now is canals. And over that 25 years, as you'd expect, a lot of change has taken place, including some very fundamental shifts in the tackle and tactics used which when it happens progressively over a fishing lifetime, goes by almost unnoticed, as it appears to evolve quite slowly. But in your case, I suspect, after such a long absence, it appears to be much more profound, and may even to some extent have had you playing catch-up. So what are your observations on that score? Yeah, I think the the basics of the certain, certainly over that period of time, in lots of improvements in the tackle you can get, way back, then when I match fished, you know, those years ago, a lot of the bits and pieces of tackle were to make ourselves, you know, I made all my own floats. The things you tinkered about with, you know, you didn't buy anything and uh, use it, you had to tinker about with it or, or make it from scratch. Whereas I think these days, you know, you're going to a tackle shop now, it's a range of tackle you can get, it's incredible. And, and most anglers nowadays will use everything, you know, every item you've got is straight off the shelf. Now, you know, being old school, what I, I tend to do, I, I think I still seldom buy anything that I use exactly as it is. I, I'll always play about it, tinker about it, <laughs> and modify it in some way. Floats in particular, I still make most of my own floats. Peacock quill, balsam, wood. You can buy all the materials now. You can buy carbon fibre, stems, and the plastic, the bristles, uh, even the little eyes you can buy, so... Um, I suppose that's a hobby as well, making bits and pieces for fishing. Would it be right in thinking that first time round it was primarily the rod and reel era, with poles perhaps just starting to creep in onto the UK scene? Not quite. So, so when I started fishing, obviously the youngster, it was rod and reel then, there was no such thing as a pole. I suppose I must have been in my teens, maybe, when fiery glass poles came along. But, you know, the weight of those things was incredible. I think we got up to about maybe seven or eight metres with fiberglass, but it was very, very heavy. But no, carbon fibre poles had come along uh, before I packed up much fishing, and uh, I mean, obviously nothing like the quality of a pole you can get today, but uh, I think they got then up to about maybe about 11 metres, something like that. But, you know, hell of a weight uh, when you tried to fish them at that length, but still very effective in the day. Now I've got a pole that's 16 metres and uh, quite manageable at that length. It's uh, a different world. I said in my introduction that initially you took a short break to recharge your batteries. But what's the full story behind that? And what was it that ultimately tempted you back? The reason I, I drifted out is that I think I just got a bit fed up with it really, a bit stale and uh, fished very seriously match fishing between the ages of about late teens and early thirties. You know, it was quite a period of time and it, it just got all too much eventually. I mean, it, you know, it became almost, almost a full-time job. And that is at the expense of other things that you want to do with your life. You know, it's at the expense of, I suppose, the relationships, the expense of work as well, you know, and, and people can just become sort of preoccupied with a, a hobby that uh, has got out of hand, really. So, well, I've been a very successful match hand for quite a number of years, but then I've begun to uh, win less, noticeably less, and, and I knew why, and then you're exactly why. It's because I, I wasn't spending the time preparing for matches, 
I just lost some of the interest and, and some of the edge. So um, I think I'm the type of person, if I do anything, I like to do it properly. So uh, I wasn't doing it properly. So I thought, well, you know, uh, this showing no sign of changing. So I think I'll call it a day for a bit. <laughs> Probably not ever intending to pack up for, you know, for the period of time I did pack up for. But um, once you stop fishing, it's sort of out of your blood and you just haven't got the urge to go fishing anymore. Well, I never quite packed up. I did a little bit of pleasure fishing over the years. I went on the Ribble maybe a couple of times a season. Holidays as well. That was a time when I could fish, when we went on holiday. Off into France for a couple of weeks, two or three weeks. Took me tackle with me often then and uh, had a fish or two with them. With the girls when they were younger, they enjoyed fishing. They won't go now, but way back then they enjoyed a trip. So I never fully packed up, but I had no thoughts ever of, re of returning to match fishing. But um, that came about by accident, really, because one of the places I did go fishing occasionally, and this is going back probably to about ten years ago, I started going on Angles Art Reservoir, at the back of Chorley there. And I just pleasure fishing, and I enjoyed that for maybe a season or two, going occasionally. And then I discovered uh, that it started running matches there every Sunday. So I thought, oh, you know, why not have a go on one of these matches? So I started doing that. And after a period of time, I started winning a few of those matches. Only little sort of knock-ups, 20 pegs. That's the uh, maximum number of pegs they had on there. But I started winning a few, and I, I suppose I got the bug again. Having done that for two or three seasons, and this would now be about four or five years ago, I thought, well, I'll have a go again at doing what I used to do a lot of, which is fishing canal, which is a, a better match circuit, really. There are more anglers out on those matches and uh, perhaps a little bit more competitive than the matches I've been going on. So, yeah, I joined Wigan Anglers Association. They're, they're the local club that tends to organise most of the canal matches locally and uh, joined the local club based around the tackle shop, the fishing tackle shop in Luster Cole, joined their team, which, you know, they were good enough to have me because I, I really wasn't very good at canals I've been had so long out. So I uh, got going again. Then in 2009, I'd only been going on canals maybe about a year then, we had a team in the Division One National on the... Uh, Canals around Stafford, the Staffs and Worcester Shropshire Union and Trent and Mersey. So we had a team in that and I was lucky enough to win that match uh, individually with £27 a chub. Obviously that's a, probably, on the natural venues, probably the best match a match angler could win. Although there's huge money now, I think, to be one of commercial venues uh, when people get to the final of... Uh, the big matches on commercial venues, but for a, a, an angler, a match angler who fishes natural venues, Division 1 um, title is really something uh, big to win. So obviously 2009, having won that, I was aware then, of, <laughs> at about the same time as retiring from work, so I had the time to fish more. So I suppose since then I've fished canals, uh, mostly. Occasionally like some rivers, but mostly canals all the time. Matches every week and one midweek usually on the, tomorrow, actually Wednesday. Midweek match, so I'm uh, dead keen again, just as keen as I ever was. Have you ever come across a chap named John Inman? I know the name. He's also a canal specialist who's done a couple of interviews for audio angling. He now just fishes small matches on commercial waters, but was a very specialist and very successful canal angler in his time on waters where maybe a couple of pounds or so would win a match. What is it then that motivates people, yourself included, to want to fish hard waters sparsely populated by mainly smaller fish? Ooh, that's a difficult one. I think it's people who fish canals tend to be people who... The younger anglers don't tend to go on canals now. They uh, will go on commercials where fish are bigger, generally, because they stock bigger. And uh, not suggesting they're easier to catch, but uh, you can get a much bigger way to fish. Canals, I think, guarantee some sport. There's not many occasions that you'll go on a canal and not catch anything. For example, two matches at weekend. 
six pound one day and a little over five pound the other day and each of those days had over a hundred fish so you know it's very active They're obviously not really big when you're 155 pounds but uh, it is a sort of a guaranteed uh, sport whereas i think on many commercials i've, I've better actually fish them that talking to people who do i think once winter arrives and you know the weather gets cold uh, you can have many fishless days or, or maybe you know you sat there for five hours for one or two bites Whereas at canals, generally that isn't the case. Uh, there, there will be a lot more um, smaller fish to catch. And in fact, a lot of anglers who fish commercials during the summer will come onto canals for the winter. Deliberate move to um, avoid the blanks that they might have had on, on commercial fisheries. I would think that, tactically speaking, if you can fish well on a canal with all the scaling down and finesse that requires, plus of course we're talking not only about small fish but also wild fish, then you should be able to catch fish anywhere. Certainly the odds look stacked against you when fishing a canal. So what are the types of tactics most likely to deliver a decent result? It's virtually all pole fishing these days. There are a few occasions when you might use, you know, for example, if you draw a wide section of the canal and uh, you might get a tip rod out and fish, you know, with a quiver tip or a swing tip. But 99 times out of 100, where most matches are exclusively the narrow section of a canal, which might be up to about 15, 16 metres wide, the pole's the king, really, because you've got such close control. Canals always, 99 times out of 100, will have a, a skim on the top. The top will be moving, and rod and reel tactics, really, are very difficult to fish on a canal. I mean, that that's why, you know, going back... 50 years, that's the only way we could fish them. But you can see um, the, the huge difference in, in a, the catch you, you would have got then, the catch you'll get now using a pole. It, just so effective of the pole is, uh, you know, with a short line, maybe a line six foot long from the tip of the pole to the hook, fishing in, let's say, three or four foot of water across the canal. And you've got incredibly close control. Control, obviously, is one aspect of it, but equally important is getting your bait, its presentation and your feeding right, too. Yeah, I think that probably applies to any type of fishing, you know, whether it's specimen hunting, match fishing, sea fishing. People who get the basics right, the tackle right, and, and understand the way to present a bait, they'll be the people who will catch more fish. Feeding is very important, so I'm on a canal, uh, getting the feed right, knowing when to feed, what quantity of bait to feed, what type of bait to feed. These days, more than we used to understand years ago, there's, there's a lot to swim rotation, feeding different baits in different areas of the peg, or sometimes the same baits in different areas of the peg, and picking a few fish off here, and then, you know, moving two or three fish there, and try somewhere different two or three fish there. And that can keep the fish settled, because if you're plundering one part of the peg, fish after fish, then obviously uh, they will get cagey eventually, and they'll be back off and stop feeding. So uh, I found that to be very important, the rotating the uh, peg. Going back to John Inman again, when he fished the Division 1 competitions, he said that many of the clubs and matches in those days would borrow certain baits. Bloodworm, for example, was a particularly Preston area bait. As such, he became a squat specialist. But given a free hand, what are the best baits, tactics and feeding regimes to get the maximum out of most canal scenarios? Bloodworm is an incredibly effective bait, and it still is the case that many clubs or, or waters will, will, it will be bound out right. There are a number of waters now, particularly canals down in the Midlands, where they allow bloodworm and joke uh, during the winter month. They ban it in, uh, through the summer, they allow it during the winter. The reasoning behind that is that it does allow the anglers fishing the winter matches when it can be very tough at times. And, you know, let's say we've had a frost the night before, a very cold day. Anglers will usually catch fish using bloodworm and joke. Circuit I tend to fish, which is around the northwest of England here. Bloodworm is banned all year round. But bread has been a revelation to me. That's a bait that I use most of the time now, summer and winter. And um, it's not something we fish years ago. Years ago, it was round here, bloodworm and joke. And I think the fish became preoccupied with those baits. 
and go along with any other bit and, and you wouldn't compete. But since it isn't used around here now, and uh, I think people have put a lot of thought into way, in, in ways to use bread properly and take a match where both boats are allowed, often bread will outfish bloodworm now. Not always, but uh, often that's the case. I don't miss fishing bloodworm really. I mean, that, that used to be, I suppose, one of the methods I fished most, but it's such a fiddly bait, and as you're getting older, I suppose, and your eyes aren't quite as good, which mine aren't. <laughs> I don't really miss it. Uh, we did have a league a couple of years ago where it was allowed just for that league. I think it was five or six matches on the rough of canal. And I enjoyed fishing it for those matches, but, uh, and a lot of fish were caught on it, but, uh, no, I don't miss it really, and most people I think these days are quite happy to fish other birds. And the weights suggest, I think, that blue worm really wouldn't, I think on many occasions, produce better weights than catching on bread, casters, squats, pinkies. Looking at things over the past 25 years, would I be right in saying that changes on the canal match scene have not been as marked as the changes experienced in other areas of the match circuit? Yeah. When I started fishing again, I mean, it really wasn't a revelation, I'd, I'd, because I'd not bought the angling papers, as I said, never quite packed up. I'd fished a little bit, but just the simplest of pleasure fishing. But uh, when I started properly again, and by the angling times, I'd look through the match pages, and I didn't recognise the venue. You know, I'd look through the northwest section, the whole of the region matches, and maybe I'd find one on a, a venue I recognised, maybe on the Lees and Liverpool Canal, but every other match report was from some place I'd never heard of, and, and uh, these are commercials. I wouldn't knock it, you know, I mean, people love it. So I have many friends I used to fish with who are dedicated to fishing commercials and never again once set foot on a canal. They, they absolutely love it, but... I think having at my age, and I'm 64 now, just really got going again in the last few years. I was very happy just to go back to doing what I know. So is the canal match circuit independent from the rest of the course match circuit, in the sense that it attracts who it attracts and the rest do other things? And if so, how is it structured? Well, the people who are fishing on canals are, well, as I'm a little at the older end of the, the spectrum, but there are um, very, very few younger anglers. I think a, a younger match angler now will gravitate towards commercials. On canals, you might find a handful of anglers in the sort of teens, twenties, but 19 out of 20 anglers will be 40 plus. And we've got some coming along to the matches who are in their eighties. <laughs> you tend to see them more in the summer, but uh, I don't feel particularly old. I guess the average age of a canal match angler now must be 50, not young. Do you think this trend of the older anglers fishing the canals and the younger ones preferring the commercials has anything to do with what the two age groups have been brought up with? Or is it a natural part of growing older to gravitate towards the slower pace of the canal match scene? It doesn't seem to be doing, no, I think most of the people fishing canals are people who've never left canals, you know, they've fished them all their lives. A number of them do fish commercials during the summer and um, go back on canals in the winter, but I think it's just what you know. I, I enjoy canals because as a young man, as a youngster, uh, that's what I started doing, really enjoyed it, and still get that same enjoyment now from doing that. Whereas a young angler now, I think, will go on a commercial and that is what they begin then to do. And I think most of them have never been on a, a natural venue. They fish commercials that are very convenient. So on the canal, you've people walking along the solar path, you've got cyclists, you've lots of sort of disruption. You've got all the dog mess, which is a, a real <laughs> problem these days. People don't always seem to uh, pick it up. So it's not the most friendly place to be a canal towpath and, and of course in a commercial you get none of that. They often have a cafe for example. The bigger commercials well, I believe will have a cafe, you, know, you can go and get your breakfast there before you fish. Parking is very convenient, you've no long walks to your peg, you've no people walking around as I say, you know, you've no disruption. I can see all those attractions to it and I'm sure if I was a much younger man I guess I'd be doing that as well. But I'm just happy to do what I did back then. 
Because of your 25-year absence and the opportunity to compare and contrast two totally different eras, do you think that commercial fisheries offering shortcuts to almost everything, depending of course on how they're stocked, coupled to a willingness these days to sit with high-protein baits for as long as it takes to get the desired result, is having a detrimental effect on the pool of anglers from which good all-round match teams and national squads can ultimately be chosen. Or to put it another way, whatever happened to serving angling apprenticeship? I think to some extent, yes, it will serve. Not that I ever aspired to that level, but the national team, they are faced every year with a natural venue in different countries around Europe. They're not fishing on commercial venues, so... The England team um, at the moment, some of whom I used to fish with years ago, have all had a grounding on natural venues, be it on canals or, or rivers, even though some of them now fish commercial venues, probably for the biggest part of their match fishing time. They will still fish natural venues from time to time, but they've had a grounding and education on fishing natural venues. But yeah, when that the current generation of England anglers disappear, then I do fear for the future, really, because many of the younger anglers just haven't had the right sort of grounding to tackle the, the, the natural venues that they would be first with fishing for England abroad. In addition to that, are anglers now losing the ability to successfully target certain species of fish, such as perch, roach and rub, which often don't appear on the menu at many commercial fisheries these days? I think so, yeah. During the summer months, most commercials matches are dominated by carp, from what I can gather. I think when it cools off a bit, there are other species in it. I think there are quite a number of commercial fishery owners now who stock the waters with roach, with perch. And I think they find, they, they, these species find their way in, into those waters naturally anyway, without being stocked. So those species will feature in, in matches, but um, it seems odd to me. You've got commercial fisheries with loads of barbel, in which barbel, I always thought, were the species that were meant to be in a, a river. But the matches have been one with barbel. Then you've got species like Aide, which I think aren't natural to Britain. So, um, yeah, I think these fish that I enjoy catching, not a commercial, because obviously, you know, <laughs> the match angler is looking to get the best weights and he or she can from the peg, then uh, they're often seen as nuisance fish. And I don't, I don't think that's meant in sort of a derogatory sort of way. It's just that uh, you're catching a two or three ounce roach, and that's preventing the two or three pound carp from taking your bait and wasting time. So they are seen as a nuisance fish. On top of which, carp fishing has become something of a national obsession, to the point where some argue it's that, and that alone, which is propping up both the coarse tackle trade and the tackle industry. That said, there are moves afoot by the British Record Fish Committee to have all alien species removed not only from the record fish list, but also from all waters containing them. And like it or not, that would also include carp. Well, that's interesting. I, I didn't know that, and I'm not sure I'd quite approve of that once the fish is here. I mean, carp, for example, I, I think... They've been in this country for centuries. I think in some of the old country estate lakes, carp were stopped not sure how long ago. Supposedly, it was by monks back in the Middle Ages to provide a ready source of fish for eating on a Friday. Yeah, yeah. Maybe some of the different species which have been introduced in more recent years. There's a case for uh, trying to eradicate them, but uh, uh, that's probably easier said than done. <laughs> Perhaps a time will come when most people can only catch carp, either through popularity or fish availability, and that everything that's gone before in terms of skills and methods will sadly be lost. Yeah, maybe, maybe, but providing that's what people want to do, then maybe there's no harm in that. But I mean, obviously other species won't disappear, but they'll just be ignored and, and not fish for. They'll still be there. Maybe in years to come, people will look at things in a different way and uh, begin to enjoy catching roach and perch and bream again. Who knows? But for you it remains canals all the way to the end. Seems to be, yeah. Uh, too long in the tooth, I think, to change now. 
So it's been two set in your ways now, as opposed to rising to the strength of the challenge. Yes, I think once you get to certain age, you, you um, don't pick things up as quickly. Even though I've been back in canals now four or five years, it's only been this past year or two that I felt really comfortable with it again, and uh, felt that I've been uh, getting you know the best from a, a peg. And I'm still learning, but to take up something, uh, you know, completely it's a new branch of the sport, and fishing commercials, I believe, is very specialised, the friends who, who do it. And there's a lot to learn. It's equally as skilled as anything I do. Some would argue more so. But there's an awful lot to learn, and I think at my age, well, I may as well just carry on uh, doing what I do now, and try and uh, develop doing that. In view of the lack of stock, small size and relative sparsity of fish in many canals, they have to rate amongst the hardest venues to get consistently good results from. Maybe to catch a decent net of fish you do, because many novices to fishing will, will go on a commercial and still catch lots of fish and big fish. But I think once you sort of reach the level of, of open match fishing, I'm sure from the talking to people that fishing on a commercial venue, you know, it's just as difficult to win and, you know, just as much skill is needed to win those matches as uh, is to win a match on a canal at that level. OK, so we've got a small group of buddy match anglers looking for a direction and you've been charged with encouraging them to fish canals. How do you sell it to them? <sighs> I don't think I could. I think there are many things to be said for fishing commercials, but uh, a young angler I don't think will be interested in fishing a canal, I'm afraid. The fish are too small. The anglers that they would be competing against, if we're talking about match angling, wouldn't be their generation. There would be very few uh, younger anglers there. You know, people like to mix, I think, and socialise and fish with people of uh, something like their own generation. I think to sell canal match angle to a young angler might be very difficult. But in, say, another 40 or 50 years, he or she presumably won't take the same level of persuasion. Oh, yeah, who knows? Things change. I mean, fashions come and go, don't they? You know, the fashion at the moment is for match anglers, or any aspiring younger match anglers, to fish the commercial scene. But, you know, who knows? In years to come, maybe that will uh, lose its appeal and the uh, appeal to. Uh, Fish natural venues again may be stronger, who knows? I could see that happening actually, because I think one thing that probably commercial venues will suffer from in years to come is fish diseases, because I think they are grossly overstocked. And I think a lot of the problems that are there already, I think, are being hushed up by fishery owners. You know, you do hear tells the whole fishery being wiped out by this disease or the other, and it can't be healthy. It's unnatural for that number of fish to be in one confined space of water. So I think that's probably a, a problem that will be there increasingly in years to come. I don't know, maybe that will turn a few anglers away from commercial venues. And there's me thinking you'd persuade me out onto the canal towpath the next time there's too much wind to get out to sea. Nah, I think I'll be sticking to the Ribble Barbel and the odd commercial visit, which despite me being older than you, I actually do find a more attractive prospect, particularly the ones containing carp. But, respect to those who do match fish canals and can grind out consistent results. My thanks then to Dave Trafford for inviting me around with the recording equipment, particularly not having fish with nor even clapped eyes on me for the past... It's got to be 40 years. Mm -hmm.